Okay, we're back. We're live in Think Tech Talks. That was a very nice show with uh, Donna and her guest and her her mom <laughs> just a few minutes ago. I, I thought that was a wonderful show, The Arts in Hawaii. Um, gee whiz, we have such nice people come around here. And it was also a great show to talk about uh, uh, the, the murder in Waikiki uh, with Eric Seitz and, and the Code of Military Justice. It's always a kick to talk to experts who know about things that nobody knows about. <laughs> and speaking of which, <laughs> we have Mike Hansen, the Shippers Council, here today, and he knows things that very, very few people know about, but should know about. That's the thing. That's why we talk about this, because people don't know enough about it. So if you are listening and you don't know enough about it, learn about it. You know, we'll try to keep on telling you about it. So, Mike, uh, I want to talk about something we've talked about before, that is the Jones Act, and uh, you sent me a, um, I guess, a press release or a news article mm -hmm. about something that is going on in Puerto Rico, which is a non-contiguous area to the mainly United States, uh, and which has the same kinds of problems with the Jones Act that we do, or maybe they're slightly different, but in large part. So the first thing in our show today, Mike, Mike Hansen of the Shippers Council, is can you tell us what is going on in Puerto Rico? and what it means to Hawaii, what is going on in Puerto Rico. Right. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Jay, and I always enjoy our sessions here. Uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, it's considered a non-contiguous jurisdiction, as is Hawaii, Alaska, Guam, and uh, Puerto Rico, and some other areas. Uh, they have a similar situation. Uh, all of these jurisdictions have the same situation with respect to the federal uh, cabotage laws. Those are the laws. Cabotage laws. Uh, yeah, those are the laws that uh, that restrict the uh, shipping between uh, uh, U.S. ports to U.S. built, U.S. flag, U.S. crewed, U.S. owned, U.S. managed. And, so to go from a port in the U.S. to a port in the U.S., you have to be U.S. owned, U.S. staffed, U.S. flagged, U.S. managed. Managed, yeah, and U.S. built. And U.S. built. Yeah, and also never rebuilt in a foreign place. And never rebuilt. Yeah. yeah, there's actually six qualifications there. Uh, and the uh, four jurisdictions that are non-contiguous and encompassed by the cabotage laws, Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, all face the same problem. Uh, U.S. shipping costs are some of the highest in the world because of uh, internal problems to the maritime industry. And they have no alternative to surface transportation. Within the contiguous United States, sometimes known as the lower 48 or the mainland, there's well, all even kinds. Australia, I mean, even Alaska. It's, uh... Alaska does not have access, a regular cargo access over land. There is the Alcan Highway, but it's not open all year, ah, and very yeah, little cargo okay. and very little cargo moves on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so within the contiguous United States, the 48 lower 48 or mainland, as they, as it's referred to, uh, you've got road, uh, railroad, uh, uh, pipeline transportation, and even the inland barge system. So the Erie Canal. But based on the on the major, major river systems, the Erie Canal is basically just for pleasure crafts. Yeah, it was over in 1832. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it was a, it was a very important waterway at one time, but it's certainly not big enough to <coughs> carry much freight today. So we're all all these jurisdictions are facing the same, same problem. Um, Puerto Rico has been more active on this issue than the other jurisdictions have been. Um, in large part because there is a political status question in Puerto Rico regarding whether they should become a state like Hawaii did or remain a commonwealth or even seek uh, um, a more uh, uh, a looser political status known as free association, such as the Micronesian islands have have, uh, have taken. But that's that's only uh, 
long, long plan sure. kinds of things. It's nothing really happening yes, on the ex jurisdiction except right now. the uh, the uh, current governor yeah. and both houses of, of the uh, of the uh, legislative assembly in Puerto Rico are controlled by a party that is advocating for something along the lines of what they call advanced Commonwealth. It's the same status that the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands has, which and in the in the agreement in the uh, compact between the Northern Marianas Islands and the United States, it excludes them from cabotage. Oh, so so that's one of the reasons anyway why, why they want to do this, this Marianas is, this is, Island Loose Association thing to avoid the cabotage problem. Exactly. That's one of the reasons. Yeah. One of the reasons. And um, so the question in Puerto Rico politically is, do we integrate with the mainland United States? Become a state. Become a state and integrate. Um, you know, there's only about uh, eight, only about 20 percent of the population can actually speak English, so they're culturally very Hispanic, and so they're they're uh, the question for them is do we uh, integrate fully and become Americans like all other Americans, or do we wish to retain our culture and have some looser a form of association with them? And what they're looking at right now. That particular party that's in power that's in power now is uh, advanced, what they call advanced or enhanced Commonwealth, and that would include uh, a capitage provision of some kind in their thinking. But a little looser than what they have now as sure. the, the territory. It, well, yeah, they're fully encompassed by what's known as the coastwise loss, i.e., all the cabotage uh, applies to How Puerto Rico. Cabotage. C a b o t a g e. Okay. It's from the uh, Portuguese and Spanish cabo, meaning cape, and the French around 1800 coined the new word cabotage, meaning transportation within the capes, and uh, that became extended to mean uh, anything, any transportation by water domestically within a particular country can be excluded to ships of that country. You know, I've heard you talk about this before, and many people have, um, but it strikes me that, that when the Jones Act was enacted, which was the early 20th century, what year exactly? 1920. 1920. Um, there might have been some sort of a precedent for it. Oh, sure. And so yeah. it, was, it was codifying some concepts that already existed. Can you describe uh, we've, yeah, that? Yeah, we've, we've had cap the United States has had cabotage laws since the uh, 18th century. So okay. it's, it's nothing new. Yeah. Um, what happened is that during World War I, between the uh, years of the U.S. entry in, uh, in 1916 until, the, until the, uh, uh, the termination in 1918 of the war, uh, the, the cabotage restrictions became loosened because so many U.S. vessels were requisitioned for the war effort that foreign flagships were let into some domestic trades. And so after the war, after World War I, uh, then uh, there was a move in Congress to tighten up the rules. Back, back, to, back to normalcy. Well, even more, actually they went even further in terms of their strictness. And an important part of the uh, Jones of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, uh, the Jones Act is Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. There's another section called uh, Section 33, which is the Seamen's Rights section, and that's the section that many of the lawyers know this about. This is the personal injury claims. Exactly. Yeah, that's the one they're going to talk about yep. today. Uh, it, it's just uh, it's just a whole different area, and sure. what we're really interested in is, is, is the, the economic is the thing. cabotage provisions of the Merchant Marine Act yeah. of 1920. Yeah. Now I heard you describe this at the Plaza Club probably a year ago, and what what struck me, and I'd like you to go through it again, is that is it was fluky, the whole thing was fluky, and it, you know, and it, it turned into a monster later. Uh, at the time, um, at the time, it came together politically for reasons that didn't have much to do with the reasons we now are concerned about. Right. It had almost no national uh, defense component to it, and um, uh, Senator Jones, Wesley Jones, uh, was the Republican senator from the state of Washington, and uh, the interests that were pushing him in the direction of 
the so-called Jones Act, or what became Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, was that <coughs> they felt that if they could extend a strict cabotage to the Alaska trade, that they could push out the Canadian merchants, which, were, uh, which had a good portion of that trade. And uh, in fact, it, it succeeded so, in doing exactly. So that exactly. was the reason they wanted to, one of the reasons they wanted to tighten it up. Yeah. To, to the old cabotage uh, rules to tighten up, sort of exclude the Canadians. From the Alaska. But it had a secondary effect because they didn't limit it to the trade in that area. It became a national law. Sure. It had cabotage effect everywhere. Exactly. On our and, uh, of course. And not only just the coast, but also to the territories. It was extended at that time. I mean, it became applicable at that time. The territories of Hawaii yeah. and the territory of the, the territory of uh, Puerto Rico, yeah. territory of Guam, and it even had uh, some implications in the trade with the Philippines, which was a territory of the United States right. at that time. So it, here it, we are. It, did, it didn't apply internally in the Philippines, but it did apply to the trade between the United States and the Philippines. Here we are. It's uh, you know it's 20 years, just a little more than 20 years since uh, Hawaii, since the what do they call it, the Organic Act that made Hawaii a territory. Uh, right. And um, now we have this thing saddled on us. And um, at the time, you know, say 1920, um, with this new tightened cabotage approach, um, did it have any significant effect on trade then on Hawaii? Uh, I, I don't know. I have never. When did when did the effects start happening? When did well, it start the, choking the, us? The, the effects start happening almost immediately. There's actually um, some very interesting articles that you can find on the uh, internet. One written by Wesley Jones himself, senator, and another written by uh, a, a man who was in the maritime industry, and he basically, and these were written in 1921. And he basically predicted that this was going to make uh, the American, m much of the American maritime industry, uncompetitive. And uh, I mean, it's surprising. So to it was seen. It was, this is known and seen. Yes, yeah, some way people, back when some people saw it and saw it, did see it coming, but others chose. You know, they had a different point of view and, and didn't see it. It's funny that you say 1921. That was the year of the McCarran Walters Immigration Act. Which was another return to normalcy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to go. We're going to. We've had enough foreign uh, adventures in World War One. Spent a lot of money, lost a lot of lives. Uh, we we entered into theaters we, we didn't want to be there, mm -hmm. and didn't benefit all that much by it. Making the world safe for democracy actually didn't work that well. And you could see what happened in Europe within take ten years after that, sure. with the burning of the Reichstag and the emergence of Hitler and all. Um, so here we have an American, an American sea change. When people want to return to the old way. They want to keep strangers, foreigners out. They want to keep ships that are foreign out. They want to pr it's protectionism. Sure. That's what it was. Yeah. Both of those laws, within a year of each other, both protectionists. And the Smoot-Hawley tariff. Yes, the same thing. Yep. <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> Well, okay. I mean, so now, so now in, in Puerto Rico, uh, there were three recent uh, studies and reports released. One was done by the New York Fed, and uh, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank of yeah. New York, uh, and they recommended in their report that uh, Puerto Rico should be fully exempted from the Jones Act because it was uh, harming the island's economy. When was this written? Uh, that was the middle of last. It was issued in the middle of last year. Okay. Uh, then more recently. Uh, the Government Accountability Office, otherwise known as the GAO, issued a report in uh, May of this year, uh, which had been requested by the, uh, the, dele the representative from Puerto Rico, a delegate to Congress, uh, and that report was on the liner container side, was inconclusive, um, presumably on purpose. And the, when they looked at the so-called tramp bulk sector of the trade, uh, there they said that Puerto Rico could uh, uh, benefit from a relaxation of the Jones Act, uh, either allowing foreign-built ships under the U.S. flag into the trade 
this was about Puerto Rico, but we're in similar circumstance. Why wasn't it about us? Uh, because it, the report, the study in the report was requested by uh, Representative Perlusi. From we, Puerto Rico. Yeah, who is the representative from Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah. So we leave hanging the question as to why no similar request was made of those agencies by anybody from Hawaii. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... Wait. Okay. We're going to have a break. We're hanging. We're hanging that question. <laughs> That's Mike Hansen, Shippers Council. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about whether can, can Puerto Rico change the Jones Act. It's rhetorical. But we'll be right back after this break, and we'll do some more on it. Aloha. My name is Dan Bauer, and I'm the general manager of the Plaza Club. The Plaza Club is Honolulu's premier business club. We're located in the heart of the financial district on historic Fort Street Mall. On the 20th and 21st floors atop the Pioneer Plaza, our commanding skylight views, along with our award-winning cuisine and service, are known as the place to do business downtown. We offer professional as well as social events and programs to our members and their guests, all tailored to enrich their professional and personal lives and to give them the cutting edge that they deserve in business. Why don't you consider becoming a member of the club? Call me at 531-7788 or come see me and let's talk business and how the Plaza Club can work for you. Again, my name is Dan Bauer. I'm the general manager of the club, and I'm here for you. Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. Think Tech Talks live today, asking, can Puerto Rico change the Jones Act, which is a national statute? I'm Jay Fidel. We're broadcasting from Pioneer Plaza. We're broadcasting live stream on Ustream and Spreaker, video and sound. And we'll post this show on YouTube and ultimately on Olelo 54. My guest today is Mike Hansen of the Shippers Council, and he's talking about what he loves to talk about, what I love him <laughs> to talk about, the Jones Act. Uh, so we, we're talking about, um, you know, a bit of tumult going on regarding Puerto Rico, where some reports were requested and written about the effect of the Jones Act on, on the economics of Puerto Rico. Uh, and recommendations, well, findings were made suggesting the Jones Act had a negative effect, has a negative effect on Puerto Rico, uh, and suggesting changes. So w w what's the status of it now? What is Puerto Rico doing about these reports that were written? Uh, right. Uh, the, well, actually yesterday, the Chamber of Commerce of Puerto Rico had a big symposium on the Jones Act where they had people from both sides of the issue attending. And I haven't seen the results of that yet. And in mid-January next year, the Puerto Rico Senate is going to hold hearings on the Jones Act uh, on the basis of the three reports that have been uh, recently issued. And they wish to uh, f establish what their position on the Jones Act will be and what they will advocate for. Um, well, I mean, it's fair to, fair to guess that their position is going to be this is an economic barrier for us, and we'd do better without it, or we'd do better if it's modified. Exactly. Um, so I think we'd expect that, but you know, they can stamp and their feet. They don't have any effect on this. It's a federal statute. Exactly. And that's why uh, our efforts have been to organize what are known as the non-contiguous jurisdictions, Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, who are all facing the same problem. We're all classified for regulatory purposes as having a non-contiguous trade. And so the rules that apply to Hawaii are the same rules that apply to the others. So what's a non-contiguous um, area? What is that? It means it's not on, it's not, it's, it's, it's non-contiguous to the mainland United States. Exactly. Okay. And the mainland United States is known as the contiguous United States, or in military speak, Kansas. Okay, well, yes, of course. <laughs> Mainland. <laughs> so, why do we care about the events in Puerto Rico? I mean, they, uh, they, they, all they can do is stamp their feet, really. Uh, they right. can have all the hearings they want. They can make all the resolutions they want. It's not within their jurisdiction to change it. Uh, why does Hawaii care about what's going on in Puerto uh, Rico? Because it's, it's, going to t uh, it's going to take the efforts of, of all the adversely affected jurisdictions, namely the non-contiguous ones, to go to Congress jointly and request that the Jones Act be modified so that it wouldn't be the burden that it is today. So this would be like 
the governors of the states, <coughs> which we consider non-contiguous, all writing a letter, having a meeting, sending a delegation. To, uh, to well, not only that, but also the legislatures passing resolutions requesting that Congress amend the Jones Act mm. according to some uh, model that they wish to see. Any precedent for that kind of thing where, you know, it was a half a dozen, or however many there are, half a dozen states all pass, you know, coordinated resolutions, send them all to Washington, and Washington does something. Any any history on that, <laughs> Mike? I don't really know. <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe, you know, that, it could be a first. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I mean, it's, it's going to take that sort of public voice. Yeah. In, in order to get some kind of a change uh, made at, at that level. Okay, let, well, let's shift to other news. Sure. I, I understand that, uh, and we'll get, we'll get to why this is important. I understand that Matson is buying some more ships. Right. Uh, and can you talk about that and how that interrelates with the effect of the Jones Act on Hawaii? Right. Uh, Matson has, has just announced, uh, in the, uh, it was uh, last week, Friday, that they had placed an order with Acre Philadelphia Shipyard uh, to build two 3,600 TEU, that's 20-foot equivalent unit container ships, um, for delivery in the year 2018. For Didn't they just order a number of ships only maybe a year ago? Uh, no, they had announced um, earlier this year that either late last year or early this year, either it was December or January, <coughs> that they were going to be ordering two 3,000 TEU ships. For different so, ships than the ones you're talking about uh, now. No, those, these have replaced that idea. That was just a conceptual idea. Oh, okay. That, uh, so it's the same ships they were talking about. I mean, it's the same purchase they were talking about. Yeah, but uh, so slight, it's, they're uh, 600 units larger. Okay. Yeah. All right. they're significant. So they're big and they cost a lot of money. Yes. Uh, they announced that the, uh, the purchase price for the two ships would be $418 million for the two, which is $209 million a $209 million a piece. You know? These are built in an American shipyard in the, in the state of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Right. And the shipyard is actually owned by a Norwegian corporation. I thought this that was very curious. Yeah. When you're and, looking uh, for a ship that was built by an American shipyard and you find out that, that it's owned by a foreign country, right. a foreign, and, foreign company. Uh, the announcements haven't been made yet as, who, as far as who will be uh, providing the design. But most industry insiders expect the design will be from a South Korean shipyard. <laughs> there is a certain humor to this, sure. an irony anyway. And uh, this week, uh, it was announced that Matson has uh, selected an engine for its ships. And that engine will be uh, one designed by MAN, M-A-N, which is a German corporation. Yeah. And the engines themselves will actually be constructed in South Korea. Got it. So, <clears throat> so the so ship is like the, the ship, fiction. The ship, <laughs> shipyard is owned by a Norwegian guy. Um, the design will come from a South Korean shipyard. And the engines were uh, from a German design uh, manufactured under license in South Korea. And this is an American built ship. Yeah. But, but, but it qualifies under sure. the Jones Act, yeah. even yeah. though a lot of the pieces are sure. designed the, and made the, elsewhere. The, the hull will be constructed in America. Yeah. And for that, uh, you're going to pay something on the order of four to five times what it would have cost had you ordered it from the South Korean yard, which originated the design. Right, which would be essentially the same ship, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Same. Okay, but what? Why? Uh, why is it so much more expensive if it is built in an American shipyard? Uh, according to the um, uh, the uh, paper that was written by the opponent to the Jones Act in 1921, uh, American ships were uh, priced well above international markets at that time because. Uh, we are not very efficient at building ships. Uh, America led the world in building ships uh, in the uh, 18th century and in the first half of the 19th century when the ships were built of wood 
and the propulsion was by sail. When ships started to be constructed from iron and then steel and driven by steam engines, uh, the, the construction uh, of ships basically uh, moved to Europe. Wait a minute, you're talking about the United States, the, the most industrialized nation in the world, the most high-tech nation in the world. We have engineering that can go to the moon. Uh, we sure. can't build ships cheaper than other places. What's going on? It's been this way for an awful long time. Why? But why, though? Uh, we're just simply inefficient. Um, in the modern world today, um, in basically over 90% of the world's ocean-going ships are built in Japan, South Korea, and China. With American and, ingenuity, know-how, yes. entrepreneurship, and drive, why can't we beat those guys? Uh, I, that's a good question. We just never have been able to do it. Um, and what, what's happened is that um, in, in these th other three countries, shipyards specialize in certain kinds and classes of ships and they try to build them as much as possible in a series production to gain maximum efficiencies and to accomplish assembly line sort of exactly but a specialization of labor assembly. all the old 19th century concepts well actually the, this the, the idea of building a ship on an assembly line was Henry J Kaiser's idea and if you look it at World War II if yeah. you, exactly if you look at the charts uh, for ship construction you know throughout the 20th century you'll see a big blip in World War II for the United States and then it went right back down to uh, very low levels. That's really and, just disturbing. And uh, yeah. after World War II, the Europeans picked up on Henry J. Kaiser's methodology as far as constructing ships. And it was a big breakthrough, too, at the time, because you went from riveted to welded ships. A huge breakthrough in yeah. terms of, yeah. So, okay, so 408 million, 400 and well, two, eighteen million dollars, two hundred and nine million a piece. A piece. It's and you more could, expensive. And you could have the same ship out of South Korea for forty or fifty million. Okay. Uh, now, why why would Matson <laughs> why would Matson do that and support it? Why doesn't well, because Matson go to Congress and say we need relief? We can we can buy a ship like this at one fifth the price if we go to Korea. Why don't they there, say something? There are a number of reasons. It's not just Matson, but it's also Horizon Lines, which is another container carrying company. But it's other companies, Crowley Maritime. All serving Hawaii? Uh, Crowley doesn't, but they serve uh, Puerto Rico. Mm, okay. And uh, there's another company called Tote, which serves Alaska and Puerto Rico. Spell it. T-O-T-E. Okay. And they, it's Totem Ocean Transportation Express or something like that. And they own Young Brothers, for example. It's a salt chuck. But for all these Jones Act operators, especially the deep sea operators, uh, the fact that the ships are so expensive serves as a barrier to entry so that they do not see a lot of competition. It also means that we end up with quite old ships. Because we spend so much on them, we because can't they, replace them very easily. Right. So they're inefficient. You know, the older ones are more inefficient. And the older the ship is, the higher the likelihood of accidents, et cetera, et cetera. And the more it costs to maintain them, too. Of course, and to operate them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's because uh, they're not as fuel efficient. You, they require greater manpower, usually. So this, this is really not a good idea from a but, business point of but view. It, no, it is, because it creates a barrier to entry. And I mean, the other guy can't afford the $418 million, that's why. Yeah, exactly. So it reduces competition, and um, it allows you to have a profit of greater magnitude because your profit margin is based upon your <laughs> employed assets. Yeah, well, especially if your rates are determined by utility, public utilities commission. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you can go justify higher rates because you just spent more money on the ships. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, on that, that's another cliffhanger. We're going to let okay. people think about that for a minute. Uh, that's Mike Hansen, Shippers Council. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about the Jones Act and uh, the recent events, not only as to, uh, you know, the uh, action of the legislature in Puerto Rico, 
um, but also uh, Matson's acquisition of two ships at $418 million of, uh, for the two of them. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. That's why the government took them over. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech Talks. We're here with Mike Hansen of the Shippers Council talking about uh, the Jones Act, some recent developments around it in Puerto Rico, and um, some recent acquisitions of new Jones Act ships by Matson. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the financing arrangements on those ships, Mike. There's a thing in the federal law, Title 11, which allows very special interest rates on, on Jones Act ships. Tell us how that works. Yeah, Title 11 Ship Finance Program is uh, administered by MARAD. That's the Maritime Administration. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a mortgage guarantee program where the government undertakes to guarantee uh, up to 83% or something. So like that. that's good for the American shipbuilding industry, isn't it? And for the uh, American ship owners. Yeah, it's a, it's a direct subsidy of American shipbuilding. So in, these, in the case of these $418 million worth of ships, Matson's building, it's getting a good rate. Uh, yeah, they'll be able to finance uh, 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 probably 80 to 83 percent of the purchase price uh, uh, through Title 11. Typically what Matson... It's a lower interest rate. Much lower. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, typically what Matson will do is they'll use their cash reserves from their capital construction fund which is another federal program where the ship owner can put away tax-free money into an account and then use that for construction purposes. Even though it would be taxable otherwise. Exactly. So uh, that's a happy thing. This is all happy, isn't it? Sure. Well, why, why would you complain about uh, <laughs> Title 11? I mean, well, you it, would complain about it if you were a taxpayer because in the case, for example, of the Hawaii Super Ferries, uh, when that company went bankrupt, uh, the government ended up picking up the tab <laughs> on the two ships. And th this is not the first time that's happened. If you remember the uh, Hawaii, Hawaiian, American Hawaiian Cruises attempt to build two passenger oh, ships. Right no, right. the two passenger ships from scratch okay. in, the, in, the mid, in the 1990s. Yeah. And this was also arranged by uh, Senator Noy. And uh, when that program w went belly up, uh, the, gov the, the, the government ended up picking up the tab on that one as well. For ships that are costing too much. Sure. So the, the, the tab is a bigger tab. Sure. Because the ships are made here, they're, you know, costing. Yeah. So let me, let me move on just so we can appreciate that environment and ask you, big question is, so why does Hawaii care? Why do I care? Um, does, what effect does all this have on me? Oh, uh, well, you're going to pay uh, an extra premium for the Jones Act shipping service because the ships cost a whole lot more than what they should. So you're going to be paying that excess capital cost through your, through your purchases at the grocery store. It can't be that much. It is. How much is it? Uh, over 10 years, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. To, to the community here sure, in Hawaii? Of course, yeah. In, in additional cost to the shipping company that has to be made up in higher freight rates. Hundreds of millions. A yeah. billion, maybe? Uh, we did some studies in terms of the Jones Act uh, back few, yeah, almost 15 years ago now, um, using a methodology that had been established by the uh, International Trade Commission. And the actual uh, difference in the Jones Act freight premium was something on the order of 450 or something like that per year between Mats and Horizon. The, the, uh, and also the bulk sector, the tankers that are carrying cargoes between here and the West Coast. And, uh, and you mean like oil? Sure. Uh, and also refined products. Uh, it's, and when you, uh, uh, when you take that and use their 
model for understanding what the impact is through the economy, that number came out to an order or around a magnitude of a billion dollars a year. Oh. But people dispute whether that's an accurate assessment well, so, of it. So. so maybe it's only 800 million. I mean, it's still, <laughs> you know, 100 million here, 100 million there. You know, but it's see, and also the, the problem is that it um, uh, not only does it cost you out of pocket, but it reduces competition because the cost of the ships is so great. Right, if you had more competition, then the price would be less. People because would, comp competition tends to lower prices. People would figure out uh, more effective ways of doing things. Yeah. And well, also, uh, there's lots of uh, cases where shipping just simply isn't available. For example, uh, Hawaii ranchers would like to ship their young cattle to the, to the West Coast using a cattle carrier or a livestock carrier. There are none in the Jones Act fleet. And so that, tra that transaction just simply doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, Hawaiian flour mills today imports wheat from Canada on foreign flag ships to avoid having to bring uh, wheat from the U.S. West Coast. You can't bring it here without... There's no bulk carriers in the, in the, in the Jones Act fleet. And because the, the wheat's coming that direction from Canada, uh, the, we haven't had any imports of feed grains for an awful long time, which impacts our animal industries. So I want to put this in perspective. Let, let's say, I don't know, let's say it's $800 million. Let's just, maybe that's a charitable but in, figure. In, in, in direct costs, it's probably something on the order of 450 Okay. Say 450 uh, every year, mm -hmm. direct costs, plus all the indirect costs, yeah. whatever they are, and, and effects, mm -hmm. consequences. Um, and if we had the cheaper ships, the ones built, say, in Korea, who knows where, uh, the ones that, you know, part of the fleet, so to speak, that's being built in many other places in the world. Um, <coughs> there's, would, there's three countries built 90, over 90 percent of the world's ocean-going ships, Japan, South Korea, and China. Okay. Oh, China, too, is in on it, yeah. Big time. Yeah. Well, that's an initiative. They, <laughs> they know how to do stuff, yeah. Anyway, so if, if it was built overseas, we'd pay a fraction, maybe 20 percent of the cost of those ships. We'd have less of a barrier to entry, we have more competition, we wouldn't be paying this extra, by definition, $450 million plus all the consequential extras, okay? And that money, that savings would go, am I right, into our pockets. It's sort of like buying foreign oil. The savings you have goes into the pockets of the of the people living in Hawaii. Sure. It becomes part of their disposable income. They can go down and buy things with it. They can lead a better life. Um, every man, woman, and child has more disposable income sure. if you make this kind of thing more efficient. And not only the individual, but also businesses. And you don't know what kind of business might uh, benefit from that, from those new arrangements. So why do we do this? I mean, it's like kicking ourselves. <laughs> In because the it, because the, the special interests derive benefit from it. And the, the craziest part about the Jones Act or the Cavendish laws in general is the build requirement. And although most coastal countries in the world do have a cabotage law or a regime of some kind, uh, most of them do not include a domestic build requirement. And Who are the toughest? Yeah, uh, the uh, the U.S. Uh, cabotage laws, and there's a series of them, it's just not the Jones Act, have been referred to as super cabotage, and uh, even the mother of all cabotage laws. <laughs> How nice for us. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and for the most part, most people in the United States don't really see it. No. Uh, it's the non-contiguous jurisdictions that get the short end of the stick. Yes. So, right. I mean, if you live in Nebraska, you don't care about this very much. But if you live in Hawaii, it has a huge effect on you, hundreds of millions every year. Um, and, you know, and you're, you're affected economically much more than other places. And you really need to know about it. Sure. Um, so my question then is, um, uh, again, like Puerto Rico, it's not that we can stamp our feet and change it. Um, but um, we, we could do something if our elected federal uh, elected officers would go to Washington and uh, actually advocate for changes sure. to the Jones Act and as, they, as they affect the contiguous, non-contiguous areas anyway, maybe, maybe more, but at least the non-contiguous areas. Yeah. Uh, 
what uh, the shippers, Hawaii Shippers Council is calling for, and we don't represent ship owners, we represent cargo owners, right. the people who put their merchandise on board the ship. Got it. So we pay the freight. Got it. Uh, what we've advocated for is an exemption for the non-contiguous trades from the U.S. build requirements. Just the build requirements. Of the Jones Act. So you're not fighting about the staffing, the flagging, the management requirements, just the build requirements. Right. You think that would solve the problem for It us? would go a long ways towards doing that. Hmm. So, okay, so then assuming that we all agreed on this. And our, and our uh, par part of our effort is to, to bring all the non-contiguous jurisdictions together so that it wouldn't say if we ever did have a member of our congressional delegation that might pro uh, propose something like this in Congress, they wouldn't be alone. They would have support from Puerto Rico and Guam right. and Alaska. It's like a group thing would exactly. be valuable. Yeah. But just you know, let's assume we make we we are successful in making this change. The build requirement would mean that it doesn't have to be an American shipyard like the one in Philadelphia you mentioned uh, building the new ships. Right. right. Um, we could go overseas and have the new ships built. Right. Probably the same engines and the same... Same design. <laughs> same design. <laughs> <laughs> same okay. engines. Okay, so yeah. this is the, 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 the damage, if you will, um, the effect on the special interest groups you mentioned, would be on the, uh, American shipyards. Because yes. they wouldn't be building... If, if they're not efficient, they wouldn't be competitive. Yeah. The American, the, Ameri the, Ameri the smaller American shipyards that build tugs and barges and um, offshore equipment are typically uh, fair, uh, typically quite competitive. Uh, so so it's the big ones. It's the big ones that aren't. How many are there? Two. Uh, there's eight. Eight shipyards that build big ships. Yes, but the majority of the work is uh, government work for military for, for ships. For military. Okay. Well. What I you know I which is name, which is which is part of the problem because they get so accustomed to building for the government, where they don't have to be all that efficient. <laughs> yeah, and it's a huge problem for the navy because the cost of a navy ship is starting to escalate to such an extent, the navy is getting uh, in a put being put in a position where they can't build enough ships to cover their requirements. So, uh, so it's not just so on these the shipyards, some of which are owned by foreign mm -hmm. interests are yeah. the special interests you're talking about, and these shipyards are holding up uh, the kind of change you're, you're suggesting. Right, but for them to actually get their, their pricing down to what you can see in Japan and South Korea, for example, they would have to be able to build for export, meaning they would have to be able to build at, such, at a competitive international price to be able to sell their ships to a Greek owner or to uh, 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 Which they can't do exactly, and if you can't get, if you can't sell a ship uh, uh, at an international competitive price for export, you can't get the production runs you need. Well, but, well you know, it's like I remember one of the issues about um, all of this is we should protect our our navy. Uh, we should have a maritime fleet that is created here. Uh, we should control, you know, our the seas with American ships. But it wouldn't make that much difference, would it? Because I, I recall there's not very many of these big ships being made in the U.S. anyway. Uh, on average, since 1992, the U.S. has constructed uh, around two deep draft ocean going ships per year. Ships over 1,000 gross tons. It's not that these shipyards are going to go out of business either, because they're still doing the Navy ships, which provide a huge Right, come to the, them. the Navy uh, is uh, reducing their shipbuilding uh, uh, requirements. Okay. Basically, because the price is going up so high. Even the Coast Guard, uh, they had they they've had they've been operating these old cutters that are like 50 years old, and uh, because the cost of building the new so-called uh, security class cutters is is uh, is uh, so high. Oh. They're talking 400 something million dollars a piece. There are, no, there are no shipyards uh, that build ships of that class, of that size here in Hawaii. We don't. No. We don't, we don't, we're not protecting any particular shipyard. There's, there are no shipyards of that size anywhere in the non-contiguous jurisdictions. Mm. So it's a direct transfer of money from us to them. <laughs> right. The old story. Yeah. Okay. So all this on the table, 
what is our delegation doing to protect Hawaii from 450 million plus other damages that we suffer um, because we're forced into these expensive ships? Uh, the current delegation, uh, as most previous delegations in the past, have been supportive of uh, the cabotage laws. Why? Uh, because, well, a number I mean, of reasons. really why? Uh, well, uh, 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 cabotage is an is a, is a issue of support from the labor point of view. And most Hawaii de Democrats are very much in the labor camp. So it's, a, it's, the, it's the labor interests sure. that, uh, um, that are putting pressure on the delegation. And, and not, only just the, not only the shipboard labor, but also the dockside labor, the ILWU, even though the ILWU would work whatever ship came into port, or they do work whatever ship comes into port, mm -hmm. regardless of flag. Uh, and then there's a, there's a political alliance between the ship owners, the shipboard unions, the uh, shipyard owners, the shipyard unions, and, uh, and even the dock workers to support each other for union solidarity. Sure. Sympathetic solidarity, that kind Exactly. So that's, that's, a, that's a big part of it. And the ship owners say to the, uh, to the shipyards, well, you cover us and we'll cover you. That's part of the alliance. I think I got it. So who's looking out for the public, actually, Mike? Um, I can't identify anybody in this particular subject. A moment of silence on yeah. that one. <laughs> I can't think of anybody yeah. either. I mean, uh, Charles DeJoux um, spoke out on the Jones Act. Um, Ed Case did. But that's the only two politicians I can think of who actually held national office that uh, have done so. OK, we've got three minutes left. And uh, what's going to happen in the next Hawaii legislature, if anything, about this? Are we going to send a message to Congress? Uh, in the last session of the, of the Hawaii State Legislature, uh, we had uh, a resolution introduced in the State House uh, by two Republicans and three Democrats, including the Vice Chairman of the House, uh, in support of our proposal for an exemption from the U.S. bill requirement applying to just the non-contiguous trades. Uh, we're going to uh, work with legislators uh, to have that reintroduced this next session and also in the Senate, hopefully we'll have um, uh, a resolution on both sides and see if we can't go further with it. Uh, the House Chairman on Transportation refused to hear the resolution. Give a reason? Sure, he was uh, uh, encouraged by the maritime industry not to. Got it. Well. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes, and um, um, that's your camera over there. Um, people don't know about this. What message would you like to leave with them? What advice would you like to give them about this? What suggestions would you make to them for taking whatever action you think might be appropriate on their behalf? Uh, yeah, we'd uh, very much like to have the support of as many people as possible in Hawaii and also in the other non-contiguous jurisdictions for our proposed reform of the Jones Act. And that proposed reform, as, we, as I described previously, would be uh, an exemption from the U.S. build requirement of the Jones Act for the non-contiguous trades, just limited to that. That would leave in place the flag, the crew, the ownership, and the other requirements uh, that are currently there. It would be, it would not be that uh, great a disruption in most people's lives. It wouldn't displace any seamen, um, and it certainly wouldn't displace um, any shipyard workers in the non-contiguous jurisdictions. But it would save money on the ships we buy. It would make the ships that we buy, that the that the ship owners buy, much cheaper, and it would uh, bring down the barriers to entry. It would increase competition and lower the carrier's cost structure uh, and lead to lower freight prices and ultimately lower prices on the gro in the grocery store shelf. And ultimately more disposable income for every man, woman, and child in the state of Hawaii right. by hundreds of millions. 
Yes, our, uh, our estimates uh, from the late 90s put it at around um, somewhere between two and $3,000 per family. Okay, that's Mike Hansen, Shippers Council. We're talking about the Jones Act and uh, about events in Puerto Rico, events here. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in a few minutes uh, with uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, our normal energy show, which we broadcast on KGU as well as on Ustream and Spreaker. We'll be right back.